Well, welcome. Uh, my name is Steve Cross, and I'm the Technical Director for the Asphalt Recycling and Reclaiming Association and a recently retired or emeritus professor from Oklahoma State University. And uh, today I want to give you guys an, just an introduction to uh, cold in-place recycling. So a little bit of history. Uh, cold in place recycling has actually been around for quite some time, uh, actually since the early 1900s where they would use uh, rippers and stuff to rip up a pavement and place it back down. But really it was the first oil crisis in the 1970s and the development of large scale cold planers that really renewed the interest in recycling and CIR. This gave us a way to economically mill up a pavement. And as far as the early pioneers or champions in cold in place recycling, Oregon was one of the first, New Mexico, Kansas, and Pennsylvania also had pretty substantial uh, programs in the uh, 1980s and into, into the 1990s, late 1990s. Uh, we have seen a lot of, uh, well, the process has actually been uh, improved lately. We've seen some great enhancements. We've seen the development of engineered emulsions, which has really improved the, the performance of these mixes. And then foamed asphalt has come along recently and that's increased interest. But the biggest improvement has been in the equipment. Uh, well, I say, take that back, the equipment and the uh, foamed asphalt and the engineered emulsions. And uh, what you will see on the East Coast, the other thing that's been uh, implemented recently is the use of single unit trains and not these big long multi-unit trains that we see out west. So as far as learning objectives, what we wanna to cover to this, uh, today is just get a basics of what cold in place recycling is, get a perspective of where it should be used, understand the differences in the recycling trains. There are two basic recycling trains out there and they are different. Uh, we'll talk quickly about what recycling agents are commonly used and we'll talk about what additives or recycling additives are sometimes added to these recycling agents to improve mixed performance and gain a little perspective on how CIR has been performing. So there are, ERA uh, puts cold in place recycling under the general category of just coal recycling. And there's two different types of coal recycling. There's cold central plant, which is covered in a different webinar. And we'll be talking about cold in place recycling. Uh, this is also, cold in place recycling is also referred to as partial depth cold in place recycling because we're going to remove a portion of the asphalt pavement or the asphalt mix, not all of it. So what we're going to do with cold in place recycling, we are going to take a distressed pavement and we're going to turn it into a new pavement using a train of equipment that's going to mill the deteriorated pavement Typically it's done to three to four inches, although we have seen more and more lately, people going to five and six and even seven inches. Uh, there's some extra things you have to do that we won't cover if you wanna to try to go six to seven inches in one pass. But we mill this up to create wrap. We're gonna size the wrap. We're gonna mix it with the recycling agent and we're gonna put it right back down on the same road, compact it to a specified density and then it will require a surface treatment. Again, because this is done cold, the mix goes down at uh, higher air voids than typical hot mix construction. And it does require some type of surface mix to protect it from uh, moisture damage. As far as project selection, what projects, what pavements are good candidates for cold in place recycling? Well, we're only gonna treat the asphalt. And so this does an excellent job with cracked pavements because we're gonna disrupt that crack pattern, but we need stable bases because we're not gonna get down into the base. Uh, you can really only treat or fix what you can reach. So the best candidates are basically cracked pavements with stable bases. Uh, the more the crack you can remove, the less likely it will return. And so with cold in place recycling, you can usually treat deeper than you can with a mill and fill for the same amount of money. Uh, I happen to be from Oklahoma and we were the land of Petromat many years ago. Geotextiles, uh, the contractor needs to know that geotextiles are there, but you can cold in place or recycle a mix that has geotextiles in it. The only thing you need to do is be sure that you mill through it or stay at least one inch above it. So you're not ripping the geotextile out. 
Uh, the other thing to watch out for is you have poorly bonded or delaminated uh, layers. We want to try to mill through these to prevent uh, slabbing or scabbing with the milling machine, just like you would in any type of mill and fill operation. So there, we can treat other distresses besides just cracking, but pavements with other than major or deep structural issues can be successfully rehabilitated with CIR, uh, along with a proper mix design and an adequate overlay. Uh, the one thing that we cannot do is we cannot fix deep-seated base failures or drainage issues. Those have to be attacked separately. So a little schematic about what we want to do here. We're going to take an existing distressed asphalt pavement. I'm going to run a cold in place recycling train over it, and I'm going to turn that into a uh, recycled layer. You can recycle all the way down to the aggregate base if the aggregate base is stable. The other thing is it needs to be consistent in thickness. I do not want to be bouncing in and out of aggregate base and picking up various amounts of uncoated material. This will affect the required binder content that you won't be able to change on the fly that quickly uh, and result in an unsatisfactory process. We normally recommend that you leave at least one inch of asphalt mix uh, above the, uh, the coal recycle layer to support the equipment. That coal planer is heavy. And the last thing we want it to do is busting through into the subgrade. There are different types of trains out there. And what you typically see, typically more of these uh, back east, but they're becoming more popular is the single unit train. And these are just a couple of pictures. There's two companies that make them in the United States. Uh, see the Workin machine and the Roadtech machine. Uh, we'll go into a little more detail on how these things work and operate. But uh, you see one that has an attached screen on it. The Workin happens to have an attached screen on it. The road tech above is putting the material in a windrow. It's picked up with a windrow elevator and placed into a paver. In that single unit recycler, all the cutting and mixing and sizing is done inside the cutting housing. So there are spray bars in there that will add water, foamed asphalt or emulsified asphalt. And all the uh, mixing is done inside that cutting housing. Multi-unit trains work a little bit different. They have a full lane width mill. Then they tow behind that a recycling unit that has a crushing and screening unit and a pug mill on it. And then they tow the recycling agent behind that. So at the showing you two different manufacturers of these operations here, but uh, they're both very similar. As far as the schematic of the multi-unit, there is the uh, the, the coal planter or the milling machine, it actually mills in a down cutting mode and it does that by going backwards because we want to we want to discharge the material behind us instead of in front of us. So it's actually going in reverse. It takes the millings and it drops them over a screening deck. The oversized material is run through a crusher and then returned to the screening deck. And then everything that goes through that top scalping screen on the screening deck is dropped into a pug mill. Uh, where it's placed upon the road and it's picked up with, an, with a uh, windrow elevator and dropped into a paver and placed. So the differences for the single unit train, we're going to control the top size of the wrap with a down cut and forward speed of the unit. Uh, I don't want to ever say always, but basically everyone, whether it's a single unit or a multi-unit train is going to cut in a down cutting mode but we're going to control the top size of the wrap with a down cut and forward speed. Uh, if you start going too fast, you will get larger pieces of wrap. So it's also gonna add the recycling agent uh, volumetrically. So this is done based on an assumed in-place unit weight of the material and the depth and width of the cut and the forward speed. Uh, the pump that, that inserts the, uh, the recycling agents based on the forward speed of the machine. This works well, uh, it's not quite as precise as the multi-unit train because if you get into areas that uh, are highly distorted, uh, then it's not quite as precise. As far as the types of recycling agent, a lot of people are under the uh, impression that if you have a single unit train, it's gonna use foam. And if you have a multi-unit train, it will use emulsified asphalt. 
And that's not true. You can get a single unit train that can do either one. However, I will point out that your contractor may not have configured his single unit train to be able to do both. As far as the multi-unit train, this is a little bit more precise. It's going to control the top size of the wrap with the crushing and screening units. So it can guarantee you a 100% passing a certain screed size where a, a single unit train can. It's also going to add the recycling agent based on the mass of the material entering the pug mill. So it's a bit more precise than the single unit train that does it volumetrically. And again, most of the uh, single multi-unit trains that were put out there were originally set up to run emulsified asphalt, but they can easily be converted to foamed asphalt as well. Uh, and again, the same thing, uh, a multi-unit train can do either foamed asphalt or emulsified asphalt, but your contractor may not be set up to do that. So it's worthwhile asking. All right, well, either in the Cutting head or in the pug mill, we're going to mix it with water and a recycling agent and add recycling additives as necessary. As far as the recycling agents, uh, emulsified asphalt is very common. And we use engineered emulsions. Uh, they're by far the most common. An engineered emulsion is typically a CSS1 or CSS1H that's been formulated uh, to match your materials and your climate and your locations. Uh, there have been a few states that have used polymer modified emulsions. Uh, uh, HFE 150P has been somewhat common, uh, but engineered emulsions can also be polymer modified. And then expanded asphalt or foamed asphalt has become real common. Uh, expanded asphalt or foam asphalt uses neat asphalts, not polymer modified asphalts. And again, they work just like foamed asphalt works just like a warm mix additive at a hot mix plant. We have a series of nozzles that are going to inject hot bitumen, spray out hot asphalt. Uh, it's going to be 325 degrees plus. We're going to inject a small amount of cold water. This is going to cause that water to vaporize, uh, which means it's going to expand tremendously and it's going to cause that asphalt to foam. It's going to come out in little droplets of asphalt. As far as the recycling additives, uh, cement is added quite common uh, and lime can be used as well. As far as uh, the benefits, the thing that cement will do when you add cement with the cationic emulsion, it works as a catalyst. It will it'll allow it to uh, break and cure a little bit quicker. It'll give you higher early strengths and will give you better moisture resistance. Lime will do the same thing. We want to be very careful with adding cement and lime and not add too much. We want to keep this uh, asphalt mix flexible. So we typically limit the cement contents to a maximum of 1% or a ratio of uh, residual asphalt to cement of 2.5 to 1 or greater. As far as how they perform, uh, foam is a bind, has been described as a binding technology and emulsions are a coating technology. So these are a series of lab molded uh, samples and cores from the, of the same mix from a project. And if you see the, the, it's on my left, but the sample that's kind of brownish colored, it's not real black and shiny, that's foam. And foam is a binding technology. It's not a coating technology. The other sample you see up on the top, that was made with emulsified asphalt. It's a coating process. So it looks nice and black and shiny when it's finished. So they came back on these projects where they did these mixed designs. I believe these are coming off of US 280 in Alabama that we'll talk about later. Uh, they've cut cores from them. And if you look at the cores, the foam is right underneath the, the foam above, but you really can't tell the difference. And that's not uncommon. Uh, one thing about the binding technology it, uh, with foam, it almost always has cement in it because it does require some fines to help disperse those droplets, those foam droplets throughout the mix. So they recommend somewhere between five and 20% minus 200. And 100% wrap mixes are usually short of minus 200. It's bound up in the wrap particles. So it's not uncommon to see 1% cement added to uh, foam. With emulsion, it's kind of optimal. But again, we want to limit that. I know this says one to 2%, but uh, nowadays we typically tell people no more than 1% cement, so we don't end up making a brittle mix that will crack up on us. As far as how they perform, 
Uh, Maryland did the uh, NCHRP 9-51 study on material properties of, of cold in place full depth reclamation mixes. Uh, VTRC uh, did a lot of this work as well. And they evaluated dynamic modulus uh, of all different mixes from across the country and decided there was no difference in mixed properties between uh, samples made with foamed asphalt or emulsified asphalt. They also decided that the mixes tended, they're not quite as strong as hot mix. They said they tended to uh, perform like a Virginia uh, base mix. There are very few side-by-side uh, -side studies of comparison of uh, mixes placed with foam and emulsion, but Ontario, Canada does a lot of cold in place recycling. And they put down a test section quite some time ago that was partially foam and par partially emulsion using CIR. This was done on Highway 7 near Perth, Ontario. And they came back 10 years later and did an evaluation of it, although the, the mix has been down uh, quite a bit more than 10 years now. But they said both sections were performing well, and they said there was no difference in performance. As far as additive applications, um, if we're going to put in a slurry, you can sometimes use cement slurry, but lime slurry is added quite a bit. If we're going to do that, we're going to inject that right into the cutting housing of the single unit train or at the milling head of a multi-unit train, and that gets it real well distributed and mixed in. Cement is added mostly uh, dry, and what we will do is we will uh, spread that out in front of the recycling train. Uh, we want to be careful, not get too far out ahead uh, so we don't have a dusting problem. And then adstone or corrective aggregate is occasionally used. And if we add this, it's usually a tailgate spread uh, out in front of the recycling train. We want to be sure if we're going to add adstone uh, that the mix, it's, it's necessary. And so usually we like to look at the mix design and if we're seeing low stabilities, uh, then we might need to add adstone to beef that stability up, but only use it if it's necessary. Once we've produced that mix, uh, we can see it placed several different ways. Um, with multi-unit trains, it's usually placed on the ground, picked up with a windrow elevator and placed into a paver. There are a few processes where you can dump the mix right into a Midland mix paver, mix it there and place it that away. Uh, with the single unit trains, they'll either place them on the ground and pick them up with a windrow elevator, or as you see in this picture, they have a screed attached to the train. And so it's all one single unit. Uh, you see a ski on these pavers. That goes a long way to getting good smoothness on these mixes. Compaction. Compaction is critical. Uh, these mixes are cold. They're quite viscous. They're hard to compact. So we recommend that you use heavy compaction equipment. We like to see at least a 22 to 25 ton pneumatic roller. We want to see at least a 10 ton vibratory roller. We recommend you usually have three rollers on the project. All the rollers are going to have to have uh, working water spray systems uh, to keep the mix from sticking. Uh, I did leave one thing out on the previous slide. I'll pick that up here. We want to be sure when we're placing these mixes that we do not heat the screed on the paver. If you heat the screed on the paver, it's not going to help you get density. It's just going to make that cold mix stick to the screed, which is going to drag and tear your mat and cause all kinds of problems. So we do not want to heat that screed. What we typically see contractors do, uh, the mix does fluff quite a bit when you do this. So they'll hit it with one or two passes with the double drum vibratory roller. And then they'll hit it with the uh, pneumatic roller until it walks itself out. If you get the pneumatic roller on there first, you can sometimes bog it down in there. So it's generally one or two passes with a heavy vibratory steel wheel roller followed by the pneumatic roller that walks itself out. And then we're gonna hit it with the steel wheel roller in static mode to remove the roller marks. Uh, I will point out a lot of people think that cold in place recycling is something that's only done um, in the city. Yeah, I mean, I'm sorry, in rural areas, it can be done in the city as well. Hit the wrong button, I apologize. But um, what you're seeing over on the left is uh, done in Los Angeles County in California there, so quite an urban area. All right, once we have that mixed down, usually at the end of the day, we can open it back up for traffic. 
Uh, we might want to protect it from temporary traffic. We want to try to keep the speed down. Um, if we're in an area where we're worried about raveling, and that generally happens when we have high moisture contents in shady areas and in uh, tight curve areas, we might want to apply a fog seal to minimize raveling. And then we want to hit it with a blotter sand to avoid pickup of the fog seal. Once we've done that, we can release it to traffic. If you're going to have to leave this mix open for quite some time or expecting rain before you can get it covered up, it's not a bad idea to fog and sand it. This tends to seal the surface off and lets this high air void mix shed water quite well. Uh, again, it's not always required and foam mixes tend to cure quickly. So curing, we usually like to see these things left open to traffic for two to three days. Uh, helps us get a little bit extra density, lets, those, lets the water get out from the mix. And then we like to, we don't want to trap moisture in there if we can help it. So we like to overlay these things when the moisture content is dropped down to uh, less than two to 3%. Uh, there are times when that won't happen. You can sometimes get mixes that uh, have a lot of in situ moisture in them before you started. And what we'll typically say is if it's been uh, a week to 10 days and you still haven't dropped down below two to 3%, you need to go ahead and cover it anyway. We don't want this left open to the environment and getting a lot of rain on it. One of the other things we've seen that's been uh, beneficial is what we call supplemental compaction. And this is typically done for mixes made with emulsified asphalt. Doesn't really show much benefit in uh, foamed asphalt applications. And when we originally started doing this, we would come back after the mix had cured out and we would roll it again. The rolling goes quite quickly. Uh, you wanna put a couple of passes on it, uh, three or four passes on it to see if you're picking up any density. If you're not picking up any density, you wanna stop. If you're getting roller checking or any kind of distortion, you wanna stop, it may not be necessary. And it really, the mix needs to be warm. So we recommend you don't do this unless the, uh, air temperature is at least 85 degrees or higher. And you can usually pick up a couple, three pounds. We've been experimenting with this. We've seen some contractors find out that at the end of the day, they can just come back and roll it again and pick up two to three to four pounds of additional density, which helps out quite a bit. And again, for foamed asphalt, this is really not necessary. Final surfacing. Uh, these mixes do go down with high air voids, uh, 8 to 12 to 14 percent is not unusual. So they're going to have to be sealed up well to protect them from the environment. So we've seen everything put down on them. Uh, we've seen slurry or microsurfacing put down on them for low volume shoulders and parking lots. We've seen chip seals used a lot on low volume roadways. If you're in an area that has snowplow traffic, uh, we recommend either a cape seal or a double chip seal. You do not want that snowplow uh, peeling off that chip seal. Because uh, if you do, you can get potholing in that cold recycle mix. Most common is asphalt overlays. Um, and the thickness is just based on how much structure you need to support your anticipated traffic. Uh, here we go. CIR also works well in large urban areas. Um, you what you're seeing is a series of, the, the nice thing is the single unit train is not near as long as the multi-unit train. So it works well in tight areas with sharp turns or with a lot of traffic. But these are some photographs of a cold in place recycling project in uh, Los Angeles. The picture up at the top is actually Hollywood Boulevard in Los Angeles. Uh, doing cold in place recycling in an urban area is no different than trying to do mill and fill in an urban area. You've got to control your traffic. You've got to watch out and manage your utilities. Performance studies. Uh, there's a wealth of literature documenting the performance of CIR mixtures on all traffic levels of roadways and airports. Uh, Nevada, New York, Iowa all have studies documenting long-term performance. Uh, VDOT has the cold in place recycling section on I-81. There's some studies by NCAT and MinRoad. We'll take a look at a couple of those really quick here. As far as I-81, the right lane of a driving lane on I-81 in Virginia was CCPR and FDR. The left lane was CIR. So it had five inches of CIR and four inches of uh, asphalt on top of it. And this was on the passing lane. It's been down for about nine years. It has about 5 million easels on it. 
no rutting, no cracking, and the IRI is in an excellent condition. So it's been holding up really well. On US 280, they had done a, a, a previous study using cold central plant on a very low volume road uh, with a thin overlay, three quarter inch uh, thin lay overlay. They decided to go out on US 280 and see how thin can we put down uh, an overlay on a CIR mix. So they went on US 280, which is a four lane divided highway, a little over 18,000 AADT with 16% trucks. They put down uh, about 500 foot long test sections with CIR and CCPR. They were four inches deep. They put a one inch HMA thin lay over them. Been down for five years, had a little over 3 million easels. Uh, cracking is good, rated good. Rutting is good to fair, but the two sections that are in the fair, they said they just dropped out of the good into the fair section. They said there's really no problem with the rutting and the IRI has remained good. So as, uh, these things are performed quite well. And then to look at cold climates, they put down some 500 foot test sections up at Min Road in 2019. Uh, they haven't been down long enough to really get a good idea of how they're performing, but initially they seem to be holding up well. But they put down two three inch CIR sections with a one inch asphalt overlay or thin lay with one inch of asphalt remaining underneath it. Uh, estimated traffic over 20 years is 1.25 million. So it's not a high traffic road. It's really to see how it performs in cold weather. So in summary, uh, CIR is an economical alternative to mill and fill and partial reconstruction. Uh, if you've seen the CCPR one, CIR is also much more economical than, than CIR because it's done in place. So you're not hauling material back and forth. It's very re sustainable. It's going to reuse 100% of the wrap in place. Or as we like to say, you're just simply reusing mi mixed materials you've already bought and paid for. It reduces the trucking and it's produced without heat and it has a good history of performance. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention.